Welcome everyone to Diabetes Canada's Type 1 webinar series. My name is Grace Leader and I will be your host today. We are delighted that you are able to join us today for the webinar to learn about new and emerging technology for diabetes management. To start off, I would like to draw your attention to the survey at the top right hand section of your screen. In order to better serve your needs, we kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing this short survey towards the end of the presentation. We thank you in advance for your input. Throughout the presentation, you will have the opportunity to type in the Q&A box located at the bottom right of your screen. We ask that you use this box for any questions you may have along the way, and our presenter will be happy to answer at the end of the presentation. Also note that you are able to customize your screen to expand or collapse any of the screens that you see, so feel free to adjust them as needed by dragging down the bottom right hand corner. Today's presentation will be about 45 minutes in length with 15 minutes at the end for questions. It's important to note that it will be recorded and posted to Diabetes Canada's website at a later date. A warm thank you goes out to our generous supporter of this webinar, OneTouch, with which this webinar was made possible. Now I would like to welcome our speaker, Lori Burrard, and thank her for joining us today. Before turning it over to Lori, I'd like to give you a brief introduction. Lori Burrard is currently the nurse manager at the WRHA Health Sciences Center, Winnipeg Diabetes Research Group, and a faculty member of the University of Manitoba Department of Medicine section of endocrinology. She has 27 years of experience in the area of diabetes and is a certified diabetes educator. She is actively involved in many research and educational initiatives with numerous presentations and publications. Lori has been a member of Diabetes Canada for over 20 years and continues to be a major volunteer in many capacities at both the local and national level. For more information on Lori, please read the speaker bio section to the left of your screen. So without further ado, I present to you Lori Burrard. Great. Thanks, everybody, and, and thank you for taking time out of your day. It's uh, a busy time of year, getting uh, ready for all of the, either you might already be in the holidays if you celebrate Hanukkah or getting ready for the holidays next week, but uh, um, there's never a, a better time to stop and, and maybe learn a little bit more about diabetes. So thank you for the invitation from Diabetes Canada. And what I thought I would do with us this afternoon is, first of all, I just want to let you know that in terms of what I'm about to talk about for diabetes technology. In my role um, as a researcher and as an educator, I do provide a lot of consultation to companies that make glucose monitoring or insulin delivery systems. Um, I do a lot of work around helping people understand the self-management education needs for people living with diabetes. And I provide a lot of healthcare professional education. So just to let you know where, where I kind of come back, my background is when we get started with this. The um, discussion today, I thought we would do a D. And when I think about D and I think about emerging and new technology in diabetes, I really can break it down into devices, delivery, data, and the direction. Now, I'd like to say that there's a ton of new and emerging technology for the management of diabetes, but I think that we know that we continue to learn about what we have and that we can do more with what we have. Um, so I really want to spend a little bit of time talking about that as well as we go throughout the presentation today. So where should we start? So let's start with D for devices. And as soon as I think about the devices for the management of diabetes, uh, having been around as long as I have been, 30 years now, um, I think the first thing that always comes to mind when we talk about devices in the management of diabetes is glucose monitoring. And for many of us, whether we help people manage diabetes or we live with diabetes, we would equate diabetes management without glucose monitoring to trying to drive without a GPS in 2017. I used to say trying to drive without a speedometer, but I think a GPS is far more relevant to knowing where you're going and when you're going to need to turn and what you're going to need to do. So let's talk a little bit about the concept of monitoring blood glucose. And we know that we have the terminology is self-monitoring of blood glucose, and, and traditionally we shorten that to SMBG. And I think it's also important that we remind ourselves that when we think about self-monitoring of blood glucose, that while we do it 
as a means to be able to get better diabetes management or understand our diabetes management, it is it itself is not an intervention. So the idea of poking your finger and getting a number doesn't change your diabetes. It's a diagnostic. And using that self-monitoring of blood glucose is part of the overall big picture of glucose control. So we like to combine things like both your fasting plasma glucoses or your fasting blood glucose levels and your two-hour postprandial glucose levels, so two hours from the start of your meal. We like to understand about your highs and your lows throughout the day. And also what we're trying to do is take a look at, at the patterns in terms of what, what's going on with your blood sugar management. So over the course of the three decades that I have been involved in diabetes, there have been a plethora of meters. And on the screen right now, as you'll see an example of some of the current meters that are available, uh, I'm probably missing a few. And since I made this slide, a few of them may have disappeared from the market. But the idea of it is, is that uh, glucose monitoring has been ever evolving. When I first started in diabetes back in the day, we used chem strips. We, and some of you on the line may remember chem strips. Many of you would have used those and you would have cut them into three to save the cost. But we had to time them and we had to wipe them and we compared them against a canister. Then we moved on to the first glucose monitoring machine, which actually required a blood strip that then you timed it for two minutes and you washed it and then you stuck it inside of a machine. So now we know most of our meters are very straightforward. They're approximately a five-second test. They take a very small amount of blood, no washing involved. Um, they have memory systems in them that usually can give you all uh, your glucoses for a period of time, can calculate out averages for you. You can mark them in pre as pre and post. And if you want to, sometimes you can add more information to them. But what we really use glucose monitoring for is we use it to be able to get your numbers. And glucose monitoring is only as effective as sharing the data. So this logbook uh, that you see on the screen is somebody who's just decided to write down one blood sugar a day. And I think that we can all appreciate that even using technology that this type of information is not very helpful for us. Um, and what we would really prefer and, and what is a lot of work for individuals who live with diabetes is when we get a detailed logbook. And some of the things that you can see about this logbook that jump off the page for me is that it's well organized. It tells a story. It tells me glucose levels. It tells me insulin dosages. It also tells me carbohydrate intake. And on the side, the notes tell me a little bit about how life happens in diabetes and things that might have caused the change in blood sugars. And that's the type of information from a diary that we would really like to have. But when you live with type 1 diabetes, not very many people want to spend an hour a day making sure they have a, uh, a very uh, comprehensive diary. And so we often get more scattered blood sugars. So we, what we know we can do with all of these glucose meters is that we actually, with all of the new modern technology that we have, there is always some type of a download program that's available. And what that download program for us as healthcare professionals comes the need to know which cord fits which machine and which software needs to be on our computer. But what I've tried to do here, and I apologize, I don't have a pointer, so I'm going to walk you through is the reports, is we can get a, very, a variety of reports. So we can get um, on the top left-hand corner, we can get a graph report, we can get uh, days on the top right-hand corner, the comparative on the bottom left-hand corner, one of the things I like to do is use the pie chart sometimes after having set people's targets for them and show them how many, how much of the percentage of time that they're within or outside of the target because sometimes that pie is worth more than a bunch of numbers on the page. We can do download a logbook and we can download things like standard deviation as well. And so that's something that we as healthcare professionals can access and you can access yourselves at home as well. And so we, when we can do these self-monitoring of blood glucose downloads, we can get things like uh, a standard report period. We can understand how much of the time that your blood sugars are within range or understanding the standard deviation. And then at the very bottom of this graph, we see something called, you know, uh, um, a trend over the past few days. But you, you, can't, you can see that there's only sporadic numbers there depending on how often you actually perform your blood glucose monitoring. So... The, the picture with the downloads that I showed you do, doesn't give us the exact same 
type of information as a logbook was, it's more focusing solely on glucose values and very little that tells us about insulin. And to be very honest, that for this is the, the major type of a report that most healthcare professionals will seek out. This is something called a modal day. And so you can see that it kind of gives us a look over a period of time. And you can see the time running along the bottom and, and then the blood glucose range in the blue that's been set up. And above it, the screen is, is above target and below it is below target. And you can see the times of days and the number of tests. But over a period of time, that this will give us an idea of what your blood sugars like, look like on sort of a day-to-day -day basis. So many of us will go straight to this particular report um, because it, it sort of gives us a, a picture's worth a thousand words. And then when we want more information, we go back into the logbook and drill down. But what we really are missing when we do this type of work is that we don't necessarily have all the stuff I showed you in the logbook, which is some insulin dosages and some carbohydrate and some, some changes in, in your normal daily activity. So one of the things that has become uh, uh, available to us and to you as people living with diabetes is the concept of Bluetooth technology. And as we move into the, you know, to the, to the next, I guess, decade is around the corner from us, we know that there's been a lot of evolution in terms of our smartphones and our devices and our blood glucose meters. And so one of the things that I've showed you here is the three examples of meters that actually have Bluetooth technology built into them. And the beauty of the Bluetooth technology is that once you have your glucose meter and you open it up to your smartphone and you set it up to be Bluetooth, that automatically when you do a blood glucose reading, it'll flip into the program that matches the, um, the device. And so without having to do any recording on any diary or without having to have any cables or downloads, your diary will start to appear on your phone. So you can do automatic recording. And what's really been nice about this Bluetooth technology is that you can go back in at any point in time and you can enter more information. So, you know, you're in a hurry and you're on your way to work and you take your glucose and you make your insulin uh, decision and you have your breakfast and away you go. But later you're, you know, you're bored on a teleconference and so you open up your, um, you open up your um, device and you can add in more information. So let me show you what that can look like. I, uh, you know, the internet is a wonderful thing and, and so I went on and I found examples of each of what you could see on your screen from the three different devices that I showed you. Um, so on the left-hand side is the Aviva AccuCheck uh, program, in the middle is the OneTouch Reveal program, and the Bayer program is on the left-hand side, so sorry, on the right-hand side. And I've tried to get different examples of some of the things that you could see right on your smartphone. So, you know, you can see on the first one where you see a daily trend, and then you can you can take pictures of your food, and in the middle you've got all what looks like your glucose diary, and it's starting to show you patterns because you've got the numbers in there knowing that you're within range or above range, and you can hit any one of those numbers and you can make a comment. So you can, in your smartphone, you can open up a blood sugar that say, I don't know, 5.6, and you can say, I took six units of insulin or I had 45 grams of carbohydrate, and you can do that anytime after the fact. And so without having a paper and pen and carrying things around with you, you can create a logbook for us in your smartphone, and we all know that no one leaves home without their smartphone, so that you take that with you to your appointments. And then you can also, you know, the last screen shows you sort of what you're, how you're doing in terms of an overall average. So all of this can now be basically in the palm of your hand when it comes to your glucose meter. And let's face it, your glucose meter is your best friend when you're managing diabetes, especially trying to um, make your insulin adjustments. So when I think about effective utilization of the Typical self-monitoring blood glucose. What I always think is important is to know when and why you're checking. So, you know, are you checking because you want to know if you're going to be, trying, like, um, you know, being going to be more active? Is it time for a meal? Do you want to make a correction factor on your insulin? You use that information to make choices. And I, and as I said, for many of you, on you just take that information. It goes into your brain. Your brain makes the decision. You make. You make a decision about your insulin, you carry on and you go. But for, for us, when we want to look back and see what your patterns have been doing, it's great when we have it written down. So using your meter, especially with the new Bluetooth technology meters, that you can tell us 
the story. You can give us more information. But if you're not into that and you don't have a smartphone, there's always paper recording. And there still is the meter downloads, although some of the limitations are we don't get quite as much information in some of the older meters. We know that glucose meters now are really working to help you recognize patterns in your glucose control. And so starting to see when you're having a pattern of too many lows over a period of time, so two and five days at the same time unexplained, or highs in five days, three at the same time unexplained. And so the meters are actually saying to you, hey, you got kind of a pattern going on here. And, and sometimes we're so busy, we don't stop and think about that we've always, that we're low at the same time a couple days in a row, or that we're high at the same time, we just carry on. So the devices today really help us to recognize when you're out of range, and um, they can certainly help us with pattern recognition, and they do the work a little bit more for us. And so they have reminder systems, they have color indicators, averages, and logbooks. So that's our traditional self-monitoring of blood glucose. When we talk about getting the whole picture, it is really hard to get the whole picture from doing traditional self-monitoring of blood glucose with the meter because it's one second of one minute of one hour of one day. And, you know, it's hard to get enough values to sort of see what's going on um, over, throughout the course of time. And that's why we've been, we've been excited to have the introduction of continuous glucose monitoring. And these are systems that, you know, continue to only improve in their quality and their ability um, and I've given you the two examples of continuous glucose monitoring on the screen that we have available to us in Canada that are patient friendly. There are, there are some that are research friendly, um, meaning that they're blinded and that we use them for research studies. But the two that you see on your screen, the one on your left hand side is the continuous glucose monitoring system that's built into the Medtronic pump system. And the one on your right hand side is the standalone uh, system from Dexcom. And, you know, what I've tried to show you is, is that in the Mantronic system on the left hand side, you have a receiver, which is the right, is in the top of the, of the abdomen without the tubing attached to it. And that your pump is actually where you see the results of the continuous glucose monitoring. You can just see the value right on the pump that's attached to the tubing there. So the continuous glucose monitoring system is there. And then also that the, the meter speaks into it as well. Important to remember that. Um, that we still calibrate continuous glucose monitoring systems with finger sticks. On the right-hand side with your standalone unit, what you can see is that there's a receiver, but now we know that actually there's smartphone apps for the Dexcom 5, and so people can actually not carry their receiver. They can actually use it right to their device. Uh, whether it be their Android or their or their um, Apple device. And many people don't want to carry more devices. And we don't want to pull out devices necessarily. We don't want people to ask us what we have. So everybody's always looking at their phone. We know that. So, so it's easy to have that information in the palm of your hand. Um, just a reminder about continuous glucose monitoring. Um, it's sensors that sit in the interstitial fluid. They can stay into place for several days to a week. Um, then they're supposed to be replaced. They do require calibration. Um, and right now in Canada, we still require that you confirm the glucose level with a capillary test, so a finger stick, before you make any change in treatment. We know that these devices show us the trends in terms of which direction your glucose is going, and that when you download them, that you can certainly see your patterns. Probably one of the most um, important issues around continuous glucose monitoring for those that use them is that we can have alarms for highs and lows and there is Bluetooth technology available there as well that allows you to call a friend via your CGM so someone else can actually have the app on their device and be able to understand what direction, say, your child's glucose level is going in. Um, so, and, and because of the lag time, there is a lag time between interstitial fluid and capillary, so the devices don't always 100% line up, but certainly the continuous glucose monitoring systems that we have in Canada now have proven their, their um, safety and that they are uh, accurate, so we can feel quite comfortable with them. In terms of what we see when we download these, however, this is where we kind of can get a little bit of paralysis. And I, as a healthcare professional, get a little bit par paralyzed when I get one of these charts in front of me because there's you can see there's multiple days, each day is in a color, and there's colors indicating very high and low and where the blood sugars are, and there doesn't seem to be a, a pattern that just jumps out of the page. And, and if you're looking at these for yourself, they may be more confusing than they are helpful. 
So fortunately, um, both of the, the companies that have CGM within the country have um, uh, software reports that are a little bit more user friendly. So when you look at the left hand side of your screen, you can see the Medtronic uh, an example of some of the reports. There are multiple, multiple reports. But what I tried to do was bring out the ones that are like the pictures worth a thousand words for you. So on the left hand side, you can see that on the top, there's kind of like that modal day I showed you with glucose monitoring, but this is a bunch of days all together. And what you have is you sort of have a more visual graph of highs and lows and what the variability within any of the blood sugars are. And then of course, you've got your standard deviations at the bottom. And on the right-hand side is the Dyson program, which you can put the Dexcom into, and it captures something now called ambulatory glucose profile, which has been around for about 30 years, but only been accessible since the Dyson program uh, gave it to us. And also it, it's available in one of the other newer meters. But what you see on both of these types of charts is the darker line in the middle is kind of the mean blood sugar, which is what you're typically doing. And then you've got a range on each side of it, which is the darker colors, which show that about 50% of your blood sugars fall within that range. And then you have the outside range. And on this report, you can also see that there's some numbers at the top and that there's some daily graphs on the bottom. So sometimes using these types of collapsed versions of the spaghetti graph that I showed you earlier helps us to use us and you use your continuous glucose monitoring uh, uh, values of, of more effectively to make the changes that you might require. And most recently, over the course of the last um, October, November, December, four months, we've seen the introduction of a new system called Flash Glucose Monitoring. And just to explain this a little bit to you, um, so flash glucose monitoring is a sensor that goes into the upper arm is the only place that it's been approved for use. Um, this, unlike a continuous glucose monitoring system, does not require calibration, but it too reads out um, blood sugars, uh, re records them and, and reads them out when you flash over them versus the continuous glucose monitor, which actually shows it on your screen um, about every five minutes. This, you just swipe it with the reader and you'll see what your glucose is, but you can do that as many times a day as you'd like to. Um, these sensors are good for 14 days. The downside of this type of a system, while it does give you trend arrows, so it tells you whether you're going up or down and how fast you're going up or down, is there isn't an alarm system. Um, and for many people, the uh, information that we get from it is great in terms of the profile, but it also has, like any typical glucose monitor, you can see logbooks and daily trends and averages. Um, but one of the things that is also available from the flash monitoring, and I've given you examples of what the screen might look like, you can get a typical logbook. So you can see what you are at different times of the day, according to a, a typical logbook or on the right-hand side of the screen, I've given you an example, again, of the glucose pattern, which is, again, that ambulatory glucose profile that I showed you with a CGM report. And here, again, the line, dark line in the middle is the mean of all your blood sugars, so the, the average, and then you've got your variance about 50%, and then your variance at 80%. And there's a stoplight system that can tell you if you seem to be patterning low or patterning high and, and how you're doing. So for people who live with diabetes, they like the convenience of no finger stick and the, and the reader. For people managing individuals with diabetes, we certainly like these graphs that help us to take a look at all of your numbers and see a pattern uh, without us having to do a lot of work. Okay, so let's move on and talk about our next D, which is delivery. So um, there will be time for a few questions at the end. So when I think about delivery, uh, obviously we're thinking about insulin dosing and delivery. So Again, we've seen the introduction and actually the withdrawal of a couple of pump systems. Um, so now we have basically two primary pumps in Canada. On the left-hand side of the screen is the uh, Insulet Omnipod pump. And what you can see is it is a standalone pod. So it's at the bottom of the screen where you have an insulin contained in the pod. And then what you see in the top of the screen is you have a device that's your uh, calculator where you put program in your insulin dosages, your basal insulin. But the beauty of this particular system is, is that it doesn't have any tubing and so you're not attached to the tubing. Um, on the other hand is the Medtronic system and I spoke about it a little bit earlier because it does have continuous glucose monitoring built into it. On the top you can see the pump 
Um, then you can see in the little corner on the right hand side that it says 5.6, which is the glucose level. And then there's the meter and there's the tiny little sensor there. But what's at the bottom of the screen is the insertion site and the tubing. So this is a tubed system. When I think about people using insulin pumps, I think that often uh, individuals choose insulin pumps because of the convenience of insulin delivery. And I really hope that people actually think a little bit differently. The convenience of an insulin pump is not that you don't have to poke yourself every time you give insulin. It is that if you use it properly, and I've given you an example here, you can see in the very light gray line at the bottom that goes from zero to one at 12 a.m. and at the other end, that's basal insulin. So that's your background insulin. And we should be using pumps for the purpose of for the purpose of making sure that we have good basal insulin, not that we are using it so that we don't actually have to poke ourselves. So the idea behind it, using the insulin pump is that you work with your educator and your healthcare professional and you figure out which basal rates you need. And I'll just draw your attention to the one little bump there and it says at 4 a.m., basal program to help prevent dawn phenomena. So you can see the basal rate went up. And then after 12 p.m., you can see the basal rate went down because it was uh, during walking to prevent low blood sugars. This is why we're using insulin pumps. This is to get the best background insulin that we can. And the fact that we can use it to bolus whenever we need to, that's a calculation in terms of your pump and helping to know what your insulin sensitivity is and those sorts of things. But definitely, this is the beauty of the pump is the, ba is the basal insulin. In terms of other di insulin de dosing and delivery, of course, we have insulin pens. So popping up on your screen now is an example of the insulin pens that are available. And this is the line from Eli Lilly. And so you can see that they have disposable pens. They have memory pens in the memoir. Actually, it's been discontinued, but it's still kicking around a little bit there. Half-dose pens. Um, and then they have a newer generation of pens. When we look at this pen that's just popped up, for those of you that might be interested, if you need more insulin and an injection, this is a U200 pen. So we have a new uh, uh, formulation of insulin lies pro or humalog that's more concentrated. This is the device. Here we have an example of the Novo Nordisk pens. And again, we have the traditional refillable pens. We have the flex pens. We also have a memory pen here as well. And Novo Nordisk also has a half unit pen. And memory pens are important, it's even like we often think, well, who's got problems with memories? And we go, well, that's typically people with, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes because they're getting older. But I'm sure many of you living with type 1 diabetes go, did I take my insulin? Didn't I take my insulin? And when your pen has a memory, it's very helpful for you to know whether or not you took that last dose of insulin. Um, also, in terms of insulin delivery, uh, these are some of the other um, uh, newer pens from Novo Nordisk. And again, built-in memory systems. Um, and being able to tell you when you took your last dose. And then the last group of pens that I'm showing you here are the ones from um, Sanofi in terms of the Click Star, the Solo Star, and the, the Half Dose pen on, or the Junior Star. I, I realize that I have um, not included because relatively new to the insulin family is the Basaglar pen, which is, um, is for um, Basaglar from Lilly, and it is a similar pen to the the pre-filled pens that they already have, whether that be for uh, N or our Humalog. And then more recently, we know that we've seen the launch of uh, insulin Deglodec or Traceba from Novo Nordisk, and that pen is the Flex Touch, so no reach on that pen either. Good. All right. So the other thing that's happening in insulin dosing and delivery, so the pens have some built-in um, memories for you, but they're not smart pens. So what we're starting to see now is insulin pens, and I've just given you an example because these really are under construction still. They're coming in the future. Several of the companies are working on pens, and I believe that even Eli, Eli Lilly may have gotten some approval recently in the U.S. for a pen that helps you, just like those of you that use a pump and you program in your correction factor and your insulin sensitivity factor and you, and you put your glucose in and all of a sudden it magically tells you how much insulin you should take that these devices are under construction to be able to do finer, more precise uh, dosing with you um, in, in between the pen and, and with the Bluetooth technology going into the smartphones as well. 
so we do know that there are some advances coming for people who are not using insulin pumps in terms of helping them with the insulin calculation. The other thing is, is that we know that we have the opportunity that there are already some insulin dosing support meters out there. Now, I think that um, with the exception of uh, um, uh, the uh, basal insulin using market, that, the, that this is a, an opportunity for us to use the, especially the insulin for insulin mealtime dosing calculation. Um, and again, this is working with your healthcare professional to set up your insulin correction factor and your insulin sensitivity factor and your normal ranges. And then the insulin, uh, when you do your blood sugar, will tell you uh, what a suggested dose could be. And many people like these also for the insulin on board factor that tells you how much active insulin that you still have circulating to know whether or not you can safely take another correction factor of insulin. So these are these are out there um, uh, uh, and are certainly available to help with insulin uh, delivery. And you might ask as well if there's an app for that. And many of these do are starting to have uh, Bluetooth technology to your to your device. And hopefully, with time, these types of meters will feed into the glucose diary that you already have in your device as well. And last but not least, before I move on from delivery, I think it's really important that we have a tiny little bit of discussion about needle length, even though it's not technology, but it is technology. Because when I started in diabetes back in 1987, everybody that I met used a 12.7 millimeter needle that was a half an inch long, and all our syringes were one cc. And now we have pen needles, depending on which brand you look at, and there's three different brands represented here, of four millimeter needles. And, um, you know, in our work, we know that people living with diabetes, everybody, no matter how large or how small, a four millimeter needle is safe. Um, so for children, it might need a skin lift. For uh, adults, that's not necessarily required unless you're very lean, but four is safe. Some people choose to take a five or a six because they feel like the insulin goes a little deeper and they get less leakage or even still some eight but we're really trying to get rid of 12 millimeter needles because we understand very clearly that there's a high risk of giving your insulin into the muscle. So thinking about your insulin needle, you should be using a four or five or a six. And if you're using a syringe to deliver, there are six millimeter syringes available. And so the finer, the smaller, the better. And, and that's part of the advancement. And who knows, I think we might even see shorter ones in the future. It's going to be hard, though, because everybody's skin is about two millimeters thick. So our pens need to be, you know, four millimeters minus two. So wow, we're getting really short into the subcutaneous tissue when we go under four millimeters. But it could happen. Okay. So that's been devices. So I've done a quick review of, you know, standard self-monitoring of blood glucose, continuous blood glucose monitoring, flash glucose monitoring, and then you know, really about the data that comes from that within those discussions. So using the data, either using it for yourself or your healthcare professional and the programs that help us do that. Um, I've talked a little bit about, you know, insulin pump therapy and the devices that are available and technology is always evolving and they have certainly improved. And we know that there's new work being done in terms of closing the loop up between continuous glucose monitoring and the pump system. But I hope your takeaway message from the devices for in terms of insulin pump is, is that we're using it to get the best basal rate for you, so the best background insulin, not for just the convenience of only having to put in an, uh, a site in every two or three days and just programming the dose when you give it at, at in terms of giving your meal time or correction dosages. So using the pump as what it's meant to be used for is to getting the best background control we possibly can, and then the rest is easier. I get correcting the, I always call it correcting the forest, and then the trees look after themselves and the trees being the meal. And then there's a variety of insulin pens out there, and often it's chosen by what insulin that you're on, but sometimes the memory pen could be good for you, and with time we'll see some, some insulin pens that help with calculation of the actual dose. So let's talk a little bit about data. So uh, the other data that you might be looking for, and I, I think it's more about there is, there's data on the internet that can help you. And most specifically, we're looking at where you can find information to promote a healthy lifestyle. So we're always looking for more sites on healthy eating, on how to be more physically active, 
um, you know, everybody's always wanting to think a little bit about, you know, achieving their healthy body weight. And a lot of times we're looking for data on how to, uh, how to do things or how, how we might be thinking differently. And is there an app for that? So I think when we talk about doing this type of research on the internet, there's always Diabetes Canada. There's great tools on there. A lot of our tools are directed towards healthcare professionals, but there's a couple of good ones on there now for people living with diabetes, and there'll be more coming. So there's this particularly good one on self-monitoring of blood glucose, um, and there will be one for physical activity as well, and there's lots of food resources there. But when we go searching on the internet to find other sources of data to help us make decisions about our management, it's important that we take a look. And what I've tried to do is go through a few of the apps that have been uh, reviewed and rated. And, and um, if you, you know, sort of go on the top diabetes apps, it's not paid for apps. It's, you know, people that know a lot about diabetes have gone in, taken a look, they're feeling comfortable with the information that's being shared with patients. And also what I've done is I've made sure that I've showed you some of the ones that are free because who needs to pay for more than they already have to. So Fujicate is an app that really helps in terms of weight loss and it helps in terms of, you know, counting foods and, and, and monitoring carbohydrates. So it really is exactly, it's about educating you about your food as well. So if you're looking for something to help you is in terms of some of your food choices because you don't have access to your dietitian or your nutritionist or your educator all the time and you just want a little bit of support, this is a, a, is a good app in terms of that. Also, there is um, some apps in terms of diet and tracking. And so this is a, a diabetes and a diet tracker app for the for smartphone that's also been highly recommended and it's free and it's considered the best app for people with diabetes and prediabetes, and all of these have the ability to help you understand your food content and be able to make some decisions as well around uh, what you're doing in terms of your management and trying to bring it all together, because that's what I heard a lot before we saw these Bluetooth meters was, is there an app for that? Um, another one is my, uh, is my Sugar Very Highly Rated. It's a diabetes logbook app, and it helps you to um, track uh, 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 it, it syncs with your other devices. It helps you to track um, your uh, blood sugar. It estimates A1C, and it can hang on to your information. It can give you blood glucose reminders, and you can print out your reports from there as well. So if you aren't using a Bluetooth technology and you want an app to do your recording, this would be one that you might want to take a look at. And then one of our favorite ones, that, and again, it's a free app, and it's MyFitnessPal. And it's, uh, many of us recommend MyFitnessPal because it's got some very good information on food in there and it's got a barcode scanner that you can scan pretty much anything that has a barcode and be able to actually give the information, see what your carbohydrate is and that portion size. It also allows you to track your activity and um, for devices like the, for example, the Vario, the um, OneTouch um, uh, uh, Bluetooth technology, they can actually now feed into each other that MyFitnessPal will go out right into that technology. So this is a, a technology that's ever evolving. You can sync your, um, if you happen to be one of those Fitbit wearers, you can sync your Fitbit into this as well to track your activity. So certainly MyFitnessPal as a free app is one of the favorite apps that many of us that are not great at food, but but talk about food, um, certainly help our, our patients in terms of understanding diabetes and food. Um, and last but not least, pretty much, well, I think it's something like 80% of people in the, in the country have some type of a smartphone, and so they're either an Android or they're an Apple. And it, I'm sure that you're not necessarily aware that without you even downloading it or knowing it, that you have a activity app in your phones. So on the left-hand side is what it looks like on an Android device, and on the right-hand side is what it looks like on the Apple device. And you can open that up and you can have an aha moment about how much or how little activity you've done. Probably since the time you've had your phone, you can scroll back. But if you're looking for something to help you track steps, that these are things that are built right into your phone and you just need to carry your phone with you to be able to get to it. Okay, and then again, the other thing is, is the last app I'll just talk about briefly is an app for carbohydrate counting and it's carbs for cows. And I think one of the things that we really want to make sure of is when we look at carbohydrate counting or carbohydrate calculating apps, 
that you make sure that you understand what the goal of the app is. And there's a lot of apps out there that are talking about ketogenic diets or really restricted carbohydrate diets. And we know that a lot of people use those for weight loss, but we certainly don't recommend those without supervision and discussion in people with diabetes because we, so it's your insulin according to your carbohydrate intake. So if you're looking for understanding how much carb is in something or counting your carbohydrates, these are, this is an app that has been um, reviewed and felt to be appropriate. You can also take pictures of your meals in these apps with the advanced programs and be able to actually have it help you with your carb counting. So just be careful when you open the app that you understand, you know, who it's meant for and, and what might be the intent of it as well. Okay. And then it's about communication as well. So, you know, anytime that you can record better into a device and you can PDF it or email it, it's nice to be able to communicate with your healthcare team. And if anything, we know that there's more communication than there was even 10 years ago between emailing, texting, and almost picking up the phone has become um, you know, a thing of the past. But you need to work with your healthcare professional about sharing your data about rules and restrictions. So meaning that sometimes healthcare professionals can't actually accept a text message to their personal phone, even though that's how you would like to communicate with them, or you, they may not be able to return an email, they can receive one, so it just depends on where you live and what their rules are as well. So making sure that you've got a clear understanding of how you can share the data within terms of technology. We know that there is already standard set for pumps and continuous glucose monitoring in ter terms of uploading and downloading. And now, again, with these Bluetooth technologies and self-monitoring of blood glucose, we know that you can in, then, in fact, actually use a cloud-based program, upload to a clinic. Um, you can give the clinic permission to look at your results, and there can be some discussion about your blood sugars without you having to scan or fax or write them down. Um, but you can exchange information with your provider as long as they're a clinic and you have given them access. So there's great ways with all of technology in terms of communication that's time-saving and effective for everybody. You might like to send your blood sugars at 10 o'clock at night, but you know that no one's going to look at them until 8 o'clock the next morning when they come in. So those are the kinds of, you know, understandings that you want to have with your healthcare team in terms of communicating all this information. And staying on track, I think technology and data helps us. We know that there's good evidence now that email and text message reminders help people to do uh, certain tasks, and uh, and even for those of you that use it, you might be told to get up and walk from your Fitbit. You might be told that it's time to move. You might be told it's time to breathe. Alarms, uh, again, glucose monitoring alarms in CGM, but also alarms reminding you it's time to test. Health check uh, monitor reminding. So if you have a diabetes app that tells you it's time to get your annual foot check done or your annual eye check, check done, and then daily logging helps us all, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to take a look at those patterns, um, and patterns can only be looked at if there's data uh, for us to do. So um, also healthcare professionals will be getting new direction with our new set of guidelines to remind them that technology such as internet-based computer programs, glucose monitoring systems, and text messages, as, as well as mobile apps, can it really help support self-management in order to improve glycemic control? We know that utilizing these things actually can help you and can uh, help improve A1C. So we're going to start to help healthcare professionals to embrace technology as well as people living with diabetes. So I would suggest to say that now in 2017 and beyond that managing diabetes is starting to really be in the palm of your hand. So where it used to be about extensive logging and, and record keeping, that we're really looking at ways to help you um, to have that all very concise, uh, integrated, and easily accessible so that you can make the most out of your healthcare visit. So the last thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of my D, in terms of technology, is direction. And I think that, you know, having spent three decades in diabetes, that, you know, I, I, I'd always believed that maybe by the time I decided to not work in diabetes anymore that we would have a cure. But we're still not there yet. But we have certainly improved through technology the quality of life for people living with diabetes, the access to treatment, the type of treatment, even as something as simple as a smaller, finer needle, um, and no more syringes, and not washing test strips or peeing in cups. 
Um, but we want more, and, and rightfully so. You all, you deserve more, and, and we would like to make your diabetes easier. So the direction that is happening that people are very excited about specifically is the artificial pancreases. And, you know, what I've done here is I've given you sort of the pictures. So the top left top left-hand corner is the concept of how much technology is involved just even to do the research with artificial uh, pancreases. So there's a, we know that the be, there's, there's different types of artificial pancreases. There's those that are insulin alone with CGM, and there's those that have glucagon built in. So the top left-hand corner is a glucagon and an insulin infusion on top of a continuous glucose monitoring on top of the pump infusion itself. And that, that needs to feed back into technology. So dropping down to the bottom on the left-hand side, you can see how those pumps and the CGM feed into an application and, and there's some input required as well. And then, you know, the moving over to the top, which is a, from October of this year, artificial pancreases perform well in clinical trials. We know that lots of work is going on to make this smaller and finer and more compact and more precise and more accessible. And unfortunately, all of that means more expensive, but that we've gone from the top left-hand corner to, you know, sort of the bottom right-hand corner where things are like a pump and a sensor, and it all feeds into a, an application on a phone. There are, you know, various stages of approval happening. We know that the United States is ahead of us, but we do know that there's lots of work on this going on in Canada, um, and that the defining factor will be, you know, when it is safe and effective for people to not use it in a supervised setting. But obviously, this takes away all the work. And one of the things I like about the artificial pancreas research is I just finished talking about carb countings and, and correction factors. But in artificial pancreas, you pick the size of your meal, small, medium, and large, and you just, and that's about how much carbohydrate. And then the, the, the device does the work. So it's not tomorrow. It's not next year. I'm not sure if it'll be 2019 or 2020 that we'll maybe start seeing some approved for use in Canada. It's not my area of expertise, but there certainly are some people doing some really great work in this in both uh, Toronto and Montreal, as well as around the world. And so hopefully one day this will be a re reality for people um, that will be accessible and affordable while we wait for the, um, for the cure. Okay. So what I've tried to do today, and I, I see I've been able to leave a few minutes for questions, which is always a good thing for me. I tend to go right to the time and only leave a couple minutes, is I've given you a review of some of the devices that can help you uh, as a GPS in your diabetes management. I've given you some insight into the delivery and you know how we might best utilize things or some of the technology that's available to help you to live with diabetes day to day. And a few of the apps that are out there that would be credible in terms of what you might be looking for and, and certainly ones that you know, people in diabetes that have taken a look at feel is are appropriate. And last but not least, I've given you some idea of the direction um, that uh, technology is really going. So we're going to see more advances in glucose monitoring and CGM. They'll be smaller and finer and pumps will be, you know, they'll have more gadgets and they'll have integrated CGM and dosing and whatnot. Um, but the ultimate right now in terms of technology is the work that's being done uh, in terms of the artificial pancreas. So with that, I'm going to stop, and I have managed to leave uh, 10 minutes for questions. I want to thank you for spending this time with me. I hope that you've picked up a pearl or two in all of this, um, a little bit of help or a little bit of insight or a little bit of motivation or inspiration of things that you might go and seek out to help you manage your diabetes. Uh, more effectively or more easily and helping it fit into your life instead of your life fitting into it. So I'll turn it back over to our hosts and uh, and they can open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for providing us uh, with such great information around uh, technology and diabetes management. There's a lot of uh, great things for us to uh, look forward to. Um, so yeah, we'll take some questions now. Um, so for those who have questions and haven't done so, please type your questions into the question pod to the right of your screen. And please note for all questions that we're unable to answer today, please send us an email at webinars at diabetes.ca and we will get back to you as soon as possible. So Lori, our first question comes from someone uh, who's newly diagnosed or newly diagnosed uh, adult living with type 1. And they're just a bit overwhelmed and wondering if there's any specific technology you would recommend uh, as they are newly diagnosed. Wow. So I think, you know, newly diagnosed 
person living with type 1 diabetes, the KISS principle probably needs to apply. So keeping information simple um, and, uh, and, 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 and strategic. Um, so meaning that if you're newly diagnosed and you're, you know, you're working on uh, using an insulin pen and you've got a standard blood glucose meter, it's about using the meter to help you understand the interaction between your insulin dosing and your um, food and your activity. And so while we know that there are advances in technology that seem very attractive, it might be a bit overwhelming, as you've said, to, to move on to having so much data. So sometimes learning the basics with the basic tools and the basic tools in the management of diabetes are good education around food activity and insulin. You know, we've, we've done very well with tr traditional self-monitoring of blood glucose in a timely type of um, a testing, so pre and post meal to see what's happening. And insulin via insulin uh, pen, um, the, uh, so you get the basic principles and, and then, then, then embracing technology then moving on to the next step, then feeling that you're not going to be overwhelmed with all of the numbers on the page because diabetes is all about numbers. So, you know, and ask questions, ask and ask and ask. That's the big thing I can suggest to you. There's never a silly question in diabetes. Thank you for that answer. Um, we have a few people wondering about coverage for certain devices and in particular, um, if you think there'll be eventually be coverage for the Freestyle Libra or the Continuous Glucose Monitor? Um, the, so coverage is something that is, and, a, and this is a type 1 audience, so I can say to you that when it comes to traditional glucose monitoring, self-monitoring blood glucose, all the provinces in the country provide somewhere around 33,000 to 3,500 test strips a year um, under their public system. None of the provinces, except there's been some work done just recently in Ontario, and I'm not sure I know the end result of that to try to get access to continuous glucose monitoring sensors. We know that the Libra monitor is somewhere of a high And all I can say to you is that um, it's an advocacy thing. It's a discussion that you need to have with your, you know, your local MLA and can remind them that, you know, this is a technology that is something that you're interested in having access to. And I hope that um, that there will be a case that this can happen in the future. Um, but it is not a guarantee that it will happen. Sorry, sorry, Lori. It's, uh, it's quite hard to hear you um, right now. Um, I'm not sure if... If something changed in your end, are you able to, to speak up? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you much better, yeah. Sorry, you know what happened was um, my headphone died. <laughs> so I was just saying is that, you know, that the access to these types of new technologies take a little bit of time, but certainly advocacy and, you know, getting involved with your local branch of Diabetes Canada and, you know, working on the advocacy that's happening. It'll happen province to province. It won't happen nationally, um, and we, we need to work hard on that, and we need to create the um, the need. So, um, so for now, it is pub private coverage only, um, but hopefully, in the future, we'll see some public coverage for both CGM as well as um, as well as flash glucose monitoring. I'd like to see governments give us a pot of money towards glucose monitoring, and you get to decide how you spend it versus saying this is what you get covered. You know, so if they're going to give you just make it simple, three thousand test strips, so that's like three thousand dollars. You can spend that however you want, but we'll see what happens in in the next little while with that advocacy towards this with the different governments. So. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from a parent of a child who's living with type 1 diabetes, and they'd actually heard that the CGM actually improves A1Cs maybe more than a pump. Um, are you able to speak to whether, you know, they might want to look into being on a CGM or being on a pump? Okay, so there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of research going on. To, it's called sensor augmented pump therapy, so meaning that using an insulin pump without a sensor um, is – 
is, again, doing traditional glucose monitoring and making decisions, whereas using sensor augmented pump therapy, which means you have the continuous glucose monitoring system running all the time at the same time as you're using the pump, that you make decisions based on the trends that you see with the, with the, the CGM. Interestingly, you can get the same benefit in A1C lowering with uh, sensoring with multiple daily injections of insulin as you can with using a pump. So it's really about the information that this sensor gives you and how you deliver your insulin is almost irrelevant because it's about acting on what you see in terms of the sensor. So I think the question was, is should I have a pump with the sensor or, or a sensor alone? And I think using the sensitive data for what it's meant to be, which is taking a look at the trends and the patterns that it can give you in such extensive amount of data has shown in research that we can eliminate lows and eliminate highs and improve overall uh, uh, blood sugar control and some improvement in A1C. So definitely sensor augmented pump therapy can um, reduce uh, uh, risk of low blood sugars and time spent in low blood sugars, but using the data, whether it's a pump or um, MDI or uh, basal bolus therapy can improve glucose control. Thank you. Um, do you. Would you be able to answer, someone is wondering about if there's any information on advances in technology in regards to protecting beta cells or um, regenerating pancreas function? Uh, so regenerating pancreas function is zero. That's never going to happen. But um, there is lots of really good work being done right in our own country in Edmonton in terms of both continued work in the islet cell transplant program, which has been around for I don't know, 10 or 15 years already, but still relies on, uh, you know, uh, donated pancreases to be able to harvest um, beta cells. But there is some really good work going on in stem cell research, and there continues to be slow but steady advances in terms of making beta cells from other stem cells of the body. And so that is a technology that is lab-based and starting to go into some human trials, um, but certainly this is work that's being done as a in between until we can figure out the uh, the cure for diabetes, but certainly there's work going on in stem cell research. Regeneration of the pancreas that's damaged, it's dead. Like there's no ability to take the, the cells within the pancreas and make them live again, but there is the opportunity through research to be able to transplant um, cells that will function like your beta cell and then protect them with drugs that uh, stop the body from attacking them, which is what happened in diabetes in the first place. Thank you. So that concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to sincerely thank Lori for speaking on behalf of Diabetes Canada. It has been a great learning experience. And just a reminder that our webinars are available online to everyone in the coming weeks. Diabetes Canada has over 45 webinars in our webinar library online. Topics range from living well with type 1 to preventing and managing complications to healthy living please be sure to check them out at diabetes.ca slash past webinars. And for those of you looking for more support and resources for living well with diabetes, feel free to call our toll-free line at 1-800-BANTING. That's 1-800-226-8464. Thank you for joining us today and throughout the 2017 year. We hope you've enjoyed learning with Diabetes Canada, and we wish you all, all a happy and safe holidays.